up and they had seen the way the sons of Eli had performed their duties and, and abused the office of priest and and Samuel's sons were much like the sons of Eli. So the, the people came and they said, hey, we want a king. We're sick and tired of, of you being judged. And Samuel got upset. And then God told him, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So we get to this idea of our scripture reading today. And we see that Samuel is given the job of anointing Saul king. They ran and they brought him from there, Saul. And when he stood among the people, this is Saul we're talking about, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see whom the Lord has chosen, that there's no one like him among the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king. And Samuel anointed Saul king, the first king of Israel. And it was Saul's job to lead the people of Israel in the way that God wanted them led. That was his job. That was his task. That was his anointing. That was his purpose for being king. And so Samuel appointed him because God did that. Saul started out on the right track. Oh, he started out, he was doing what God wanted him to do. In fact, he led the people to victory, several victories, and and, and it seemed like he was doing exactly what he was supposed to do, but he quickly changed. Very quickly he changed from being the leader God wanted him to be to being somebody else. You know, being a great leader, it's not just about having people to lead. It's about instilling in them the confidence that they can do great things with God leading them. You see, it doesn't matter how I lead you. It doesn't matter how the shepherds lead you. It doesn't matter how your neighbor or your friends or your spouse leads you. If it's not the way God leads us, it's not right. And those who are our leaders, those who we follow, our spouse, our elders, whoever it is that we may choose to follow, have the responsibility of instilling in us the faith to follow after Christ, to follow after God. And, and so he started out good. But then he kind of lost track of where he was supposed to be. You know, Jonathan seemed to have had the same kind of focus when we read about that. And we read about Saul and we read about Jonathan. We read about, I mean, here's what we hear about him. In 1 Samuel 13 and verse 4, we, we hear about, All Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines, that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. The people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. They had defeated the Philistines. Saul was a great leader. Jonathan was a great leader. They had gone and they had, and the next verse, then the Philistines gathered together to fight against Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, people as the sand which is of the seashore in multitude. A lot of folks. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. And you know what happened? Saul defeated them. That's what happened. Well, Not exactly, but close to that. Close to that. Yes, Saul defeated him. We see the end of the battle there. We see that all that happens. We know he's of power. We know he's of authority. Samuel goes to Saul then at that time because of something Saul does. You know, Samuel had given Saul some specific instructions before the battle. Here's what he told him in chapter 10, just a few chapters earlier. He said, you shall surely go down before me to Gilgal. Remember, they're at Gilgal. Surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. Now, many of us are familiar with what Saul did. He waited seven days. He thought, hey, you know what? I'll wait my seven days. He waited his seven days. He looks, he sees the armies gathering against him, but Samuel's not there yet. So he does what? probably many of us might do in that same situation he takes matters into his own hand and when he does he failed horribly you know oftentimes we think we have to do something or bad things are going to happen and we forget to realize that we don't when we don't do God's things God's ways bad things happen anyway And that's the truth. When we don't wait for God to do his things, when we don't wait on God to do his things, when we don't do God's things, his ways, bad things happen anyway. Not the first time it ever happened. In Genesis chapter 4, we read the story of Cain. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen or your countenance fallen? If you do well, you'll be accepted. And if you don't do well, 
Sin lies at your door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. By the way, that phrasing there, its desire is for you, but you shall rule over it, is the exact same phrasing that's used when Eve is told that her desire will be for her husband, but that he will rule over her. It's the same phrasing there. It gives us a little more insight to what the plan was for God, from God in the beginning during that curse. But the desire, you should rule over it. You know, we are all tempted Paul says we're all tempted, but no one's tempted beyond what we're able to stand, but that with every temptation, God will provide a way out. That's in, that's in 1 Corinthians 10 and 15 when Paul writes to the church there and tells them, hey, there's hope for you. There's hope for us. We may be tempted, but we can rule over sin, and that's what we're told that we can do. It's desirous for us, but we can rule over it. Nadab and Abihu. They thought they would take matters into their own hand. God had told them a prescribed way to present sacrifices. God had told them a prescribed way to present incense. God had given them a plan of how to worship him properly. And it says that they offered strange fire. In the translation I used here, the New King James, it says profane fire before the Lord. Uh, my, when I learned it growing up, it was they offered strange fire before the Lord of which it was not commanded them. They offered something different. It wasn't that what they offered was good or bad. It was different than what God had prescribed. Sometimes I think we find ourselves thinking that we can do what we want to do, and, and it ought to be pleasing to God. As a result of Saul's offering, as a result getting back to him of what he had done, as a result of him making this sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel, Samuel comes to him, And he reminds him of what God had said to Moses. He said, the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book. Recount it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out from remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. What had happened was the Amalekites had ambushed Israel. They had attacked Israel out in the wilderness, and they had tried to eliminate Israel. And Moses had sent Joshua out to fight. And you might remember the story that that. Hur stood on one side and Aaron stood on the other side. And as long as Moses held his arms up, the people of Israel prevailed in the battle. And every time his arms sagged down, the people of Israel started to lose. And so they set a rock under Moses and one of them held up each of his arms so that, so that the people of Israel could continue to win the battle. God reminds Saul through Samuel, this is the promise I made, that I would utterly wipe out Amalek from remembrance. And so... We see that. Saul didn't see that, apparently, because like so many other people, oftentimes we offer things to God and we expect him to just be pleased with what we offer him. Well, God ought to be happy with that. I gave him what I, I gave him. I mean, I, I, I freely gave this to God. He ought, to, he ought to accept whatever it is. But the truth of the matter is that he wasn't following God's will. And he was actually in disobedience. And that's why he's rejected. Here's what we see about that again as Samuel talks to Saul. I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Just in case Saul doesn't remember history, Samuel's reminding him again. Now go and attack Amalek. Utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Whew. That sounds really harsh. That sounds really harsh. Samuel gives him very clear instructions. He's to destroy all of them. We look at that and we say, what kind of God is that? In fact, I've got a brother-in-law who who says he can't follow a God that would do that. And so because of that particular verse and a few others like that, he would say he can't follow God because no real God would do anything like that. We'll talk about that in a minute too as we go through talking about Saul and his disobedience because what Saul did in his disobedience, Saul and the people spared Agag, and the be Agag was the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, they were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. In other words, they went in, they went into Amalek, they went into the kingdom, they took everything that they wanted, 
and everything they didn't want, they destroyed. Now, God had told them to destroy everything. They changed God's plan, and they kept what they wanted, and they destroyed everything else. They kept, oh, they kept the best of the cattle. They kept the best of the flocks. They kept the best of the children. They kept the prettiest of the women. And they surely kept all the treasure that they found, all the gold and silver and things like that, because they liked those things. They kept all those things. They didn't destroy what they were told to destroy. And the result was that, that in their disobedience, they disobeyed God completely. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 68, is constantly filled with blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. When you come into the land, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be blessed. When you come into the land, if you don't do what I tell you to do, you're going to be cursed. That's what God said. Jesus says the words, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you to do? He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Peter and the other apostles, when they were told to quit preaching about Jesus, said, we must obey God rather than obeying men. We see that, we understand that. Saul is there. He's surrounded by all the bounty, all of the victory spoils of war. He's got around him, and Samuel comes to him to ask him a question. Have you done everything that God commanded you to do? And you know what Saul said? Yep, did everything God told me to do. Did it exactly what God told me to do. Had he done exactly what God told him to do? No, he had not. But he thought he had, or at least he said that he had. And Samuel says, well, then what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? You know, when God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. When God asks a question, a lot of times it's for us to think about the answer. When God walked into the garden and he said to Adam, where are you? Do you think God didn't know exactly where Adam was? He knew exactly where he was. When God goes to Cain and he says, where is your brother? Do you think he didn't know what had happened? When God goes down to Sodom and Gomorrah to look and to see the sin, do you think he didn't know what was already happening there? And when God calls to us and speaks to us through his word and it says, and we're called to look at something and realize that our life is not in accord with his will, do you think he doesn't already know that? He's wanting us to see it for ourselves. He's wanting them to see it for himself. Now some might say, that Saul's intentions were in the right place. Why not keep back the best for God's people? I mean, after all, these young men that they brought back would make good laborers. They would make good farmhands. They would make good slaves. They'd be good workers. And these pretty girls, they would make good wives for some of our men. And, and the children, we can raise them up to follow in our way and things like that. And the gold and the silver and the flocks, I mean, Hello, we're just making God's people more wealthy. You might say that his intentions were in the right place. But God's the one that determines what will be pleasing, not us. Maybe Saul got tired of waiting on Samuel. Maybe he got tired of waiting on God. The reasoning behind his disobedience here is not really listed for us, but it's not sufficient enough to allow for disobedience to God's word. Too often, we try to help God without realizing what's going on, and the result is not good for us, and it's not good for them. You know, it's not the first time that's ever happened either. When we look at Genesis 16, we see where Abram has been promised a son, and that son, through that son, the whole world was going to be blessed. But Abram and Sarah, they decided they would help God. We're going to help God out because, I mean, Abram's getting old. Sarah's too old. So Sarah takes her handmaid, and through her handmaid, Abram has a child. And the child, Ishmael, comes out, and he is a wild donkey of a man who will be against his brothers for all time. That's the, what the prophecy said about him. Boy, has that come through. If you look through, boy, has that come through if you look through history. You see, God doesn't need our help. He needs our obedience. That's what he really needs from us. He needs our obedience. It's very simple as we talk about that and as we think about that. 
So Saul, when confronted by Samuel, makes this great confession. He said to Samuel, I've sinned for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now I want to stop here for a second. I want to go back to the Garden of Eden. When Eve was caught in her sin, oh wait, when Adam was caught, Adam says, the woman you gave to me, she gave me of the fruit and I ate it. He didn't take responsibility for his sin. He tried to lay the blame on someone else. Eve turns around and says, well, it wasn't my fault. The serpent deceived me and, and I ate of it. She didn't take responsibility for her own sin. She tried to lay it at somebody else's fault. Saul says, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Really? This is the king that's head and shoulders above everybody else? This is the king who we see through the rest of his life story as we read about him is arrogant and powerful and not afraid of anybody in the world. He was afraid of the people. That's not true. He's not truly repenting even as he says the words, I've sinned. He's not truly repenting. He's trying to blame somebody else for his sin. He's not taking responsibility for his actions. You know, we talk about repentance sometimes, and, 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 you know, I'm so thankful. Phil Sanders did a great job talking about repentance while he was here. Repentance is not just being sorry for what you did. It's not just being sorry because you got caught, because that's what he's sorry about here, that he got caught. It's not being sorry that you got caught. It's not being sorry for what you did. It's changing the way you think. And what he's thinking is, wasn't my fault. Somebody else's fault. Blame somebody else. Don't blame me. Don't make me responsible for what I've done. You know, I think sometimes we forget that when we try to read. God doesn't need our help. He needs our obedience. You know, we look, and maybe we don't understand. 1 John 3 and 4 is pretty clear. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. The devil didn't make me do it. The devil didn't make me do it. James even goes so far as to say that we sin because we're enticed, that we are drawn away by our own lusts, and that when we fulfill our own lusts, when we follow our own desires, when we turn away from the will of God, sin happens as a result of us turning away from God. That's why sin happens, and it brings death with it. But 1 John 1, oh, I love that verse. I love that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all. Oh, don't you like that word all that's there? All unrighteousness. I love that word, and I love the idea that's there, because the truth of the matter is, God's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for faith. He's looking for us to trust him enough to do what we ought to do. So what do we learn from that? Maybe Saul's example ought to serve as a lesson for us. Maybe we ought to recognize that, that he's, found himself making bad decisions because he started trusting in himself. When he began, he didn't even have enough, if you want to say audacity, if you want to say courage, if you want to say arrogance, to tell his uncle what Samuel had told him about being king. Remember from our scripture reading earlier? He told his uncle, Samuel said the sheep or the, the donkeys have been found. He didn't say, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be the king. No, he didn't say anything like that. He was humble still at that point. He found himself later as the king making bad decisions. And the, result, and the cause of that mostly was fear. And maybe his example shows how we shouldn't be pleasing to God so that we can know how we can. What I see is two distinct choices that we see in Scripture with very different results. Saul chose to do things his own way and to help God out. You know, I'm sure he thought, well, there's no harm in sparing cattle or, or, or children or the prettiest women. There's no harm in saving the treasure. I mean, there's no harm in that, surely. His heart could have been right, but I really don't think so. Because if his heart would have been right, he would have provided what God told Remember what he said when Samuel catches him? Remember what he says when he's confronted by Samuel? Samuel comes to him and says, what is this? He said, oh, I saved all this so I could sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Why hadn't he already sacrificed it to God like God asked him to? 
Have you ever thought about that aspect of it? God asked for the sacrifice, and he didn't do it. Now that he's caught, oh, wait, 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 I was going to give all this to God. It's like the guy that gets caught robbing the bank. Well, I was going to give the money to the poor. No, you weren't. You got caught. You got caught. That's what happened to Saul here. He got caught. And, and if his heart was right, he wouldn't have had to come up with an excuse. What happened was the people plundered what they wanted, and they were going to take it to their house. That's what really happened. Jesus, on the other hand, chose to follow God's plan completely and submit to his will. Yes, he prayed in anguish in the garden. He prayed three times. Lord, if it be your will, Father, if it be your will, may this cup pass from me. Please don't make me go through this. But he was obedient, and he followed it completely. In fact, Luke 9 and verse 53 says that they tried to talk Jesus out of going to Jerusalem, knowing that he was going to be killed when he gets back there. But he set his face steadfastly towards Jerusalem. He knew that's what his job was. He knew that's why he had come. He knew he was going to die in Jerusalem, and yet he went anyway and willingly, even when he knew the pain that was involved. The results are quite different as well. The results of Saul's disobedience were twofold. Years later, Esther has to save her people from this evil man named Haman. Remember Haman? Haman wanted all the Jews killed. Haman absolutely hated the Jews. You know what else we know about Haman? Haman was an Agagite. Haman was most likely a descendant of King Agag, who Saul chose to spare, along with some of those people of Amalek. Do you think maybe God knew ahead of time that there was going to be problem if they allowed those people to survive? Do you think maybe God's wisdom is greater than ours, even though we look back and say, well, it doesn't seem right? Do you think maybe God has a bigger picture than we do? And it's not just Haman. For more than 3,000 years, the entire world has been subjected to wars and terrorism and abuse from the same descendants that Saul and his people refused to eliminate. Do you think maybe God had more wisdom than we sometimes give him credit for? It sounds harsh. I know it does. But do you think maybe God actually knew what he was doing? The results of Jesus' obedience is twofold as well. The empty tomb, it couldn't have happened without his obedience. The empty tomb is evidence that sin and death have been defeated. And because of the empty tomb, there's hope in the world. In contrast to the turmoil we see from Saul's disobedience all over the world, the turmoil that we see, in contrast to that, we see the good done by followers of Christ throughout the history of the world. Christians have stood up for the oppressed. Christians have stood up for the downtrodden. Christians have stood up against evil for more than two centuries. No, for more than two millennia. Christians have stood up for what was right. Followers of Jesus have built the world's greatest hospitals and schools and benevolent programs. They fought against slavery. They fought against human trafficking in all its forms throughout the world. They've brought peace and they've brought comfort to people. Followers of Jesus have done that. It was followers of Jesus who set out to establish a nation, the only one in the world, by the way, a nation where Jews and Muslims and Christians and atheists can live in peace and harmony together. And we can worship or not worship as we choose without fear of oppression from anybody in the world because it was Christians who stood up and said, we think people ought to be able to choose for themselves because they stood up for that. The empty tomb today stands as a reminder that God still rewards those who diligently seek him, just as Hebrews 11 and 6 says. The question is, do you seek to do God's will this morning and other mornings in your life? 
it doesn't always seem to make sense to us. Some of the things God asks us to do seem to be very difficult. Some of the things God has asked his people to do in the past to us make very little sense until you look back at the results of obedience and the results of disobedience. This morning we've seen a disobedient king, but we've also seen what an obedient servant can do. The power of God through the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive you of your sins, and it can give you hope of life eternal. Hope not just in heaven, but of an abundance of life while we're still on this planet. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, maybe you're not a child of God. It's time. It's time to confess your faith in Jesus. It's time to confess your, that you're ready to make him king of your life and to stop living for yourself, start living for him. We call that repentance. And at that point, you're subject to baptism. And when you submit to baptism, you can have that forgiveness of sins. Maybe you're a child of God. And like Saul, who was chosen by God, you started out well, but you've turned to the side. And it's time for you to come back to God before it's everlastingly too late. If you need to respond, won't you come while we stand and sing?